Stop and smell the roses. On today's episode of Homeworthy, we're taking you on a tour of some truly magical gardens that redefine what it means to have a green thumb. Explore the lush, expansive grounds of two Connecticut estates, marvel at a vibrant, show-stopping garden in Coronado, and discover a colorful summer garden in the Hudson Valley. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. They bloom fuchsia, bright pink. It's one of the most beautiful sites. Um, and because they line up with the windows, this is the great room that we just walked out of. They line up with the windows on either side of the fireplace. You literally see every time you turn the corner in the house, you see pink just filling the windows. It's really beautiful. So we love that. And they have little, we haven't really deciphered. We think they're a very special variety of hawthorn um, crab apple trees. We're not really sure what variety, but we've tried to decipher it actually for quite some time because they do bear fruit. You can't eat them, but they do bear fruit. So we're going to go this direction first to the vegetable garden, which we built last year. It was one of our big, big projects last year. We'll take you later, but our rose garden, which is now a rose garden, in the back was the original vegetable garden. When we moved in, it was a bed of weeds. And then we returned it into a vegetable garden and we decided it wasn't enough space. So we built the big vegetable garden and the greenhouse and the potting room was kind of all the projects that we completed, I'd say over the past two years or so. So we're gonna go out to the vegetable garden first and we're gonna get some food. We spend a lot of time in here. Obviously a garden of this size, we are always doing maintenance, bug checking, making sure nothing's getting eaten. We do everything organically, so no sprays, nothing. Not only do we have vegetables and, and fruit and herbs, um, we also have a lot of just kind of ornamental flowers because we wanted to make sure that, you know, we could grow things for, you know, cut flowers and things like that as well that we could utilize around the house. Um, so we have two different types of big climbing David Austin roses, um, cone flowers, these big giant Casablanca lilies behind me. Um, and we really wanted it to be an area where we could come and, and sit and hang out in the garden, have a glass of wine, etc. Um, and see what's for dinner. Over here, you know, I really love the layout that we kind of made for this garden because we can have, um, and we can change it up every year as well, which is really important, you know, for maintenance of different types of vegetables. You know, you can't plant, let's say, eggplant in the same bed that you did last year because of pests and things like that. So the layout kind of enables us to really move um, annual vegetables around, which is great. Um, and we wanted to create these kind of almost formal, informal borders um, with the beds in the center, kind of in the ground. Um, we decided to do in-ground beds um, because we thought it would be a bit more, um, you know, connected to the earth instead of building up the garden bed. So we love it in the ground like this, which is great. Um, and so let's go over here. We've got some really good varieties of yellow squash, zucchini squash. This is a really fun um, squash over here. It's called Zephyr and it's yellow. There's a few little ones on here and it's yellow and green, which is really beautiful. And as they get bigger, they change color, which is amazing. And we love to kind of just interplant 
herbs and different things together that, you know, kind of work together. So we've got basil and rosemary in here. My husband and I cook a lot. And so we come out here, you know, especially at peak season when, you know, in August when the tomatoes are really peak season, the eggplant are peak season. Um, so we love coming out here and kind of seeing, you know, what what's growing and what's for dinner, essentially. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of, we have a ton of dragonflies out here. We have a ton of honeybees, bumblebees, butterflies. We actually just saw, um, we plant this beautiful fennel and dill every year because the um, butterflies just love it. So they start off as caterpillars. Let me see if I can find one for you. They start off as caterpillars and they just come and they feast. So a little bit about this too is about the ecosystem and the bees and the bugs that, you know, make this whole thing work. These guys are spiky too, so you can't always reach in here and grab these because these leaves are spiky. Let's grab this guy, this big yellow squash. Love. Um, these artichokes are a little overripe. Um, we overwintered about four different artichoke plants. You can see we've eaten a few of them already. Um, these artichokes are beautiful. They're a little over, so we're going to let these go because these are going to bloom and they're going to be really beautiful when they bloom. We were so happy when those came back from the winter because artichokes don't overwinter very well, but somehow magically we were able to mulch them enough to where they came back um, this season, which is great. Let's actually go over here and get this one. This looks perfect. It's beautiful. So that's going to go into the pizza oven later. We're going to roast that. It's always like foraging, right? Like we come out here and we're always really excited to see what's blooming and kind of what's in season. Um, so it's a little bit, you know, about timing and waiting and seeing kind of like what's, what's happening in the garden, which is always really exciting. Let's see if we can find anything else over here that's ready to go. We love having a ton of herbs around. Um, we just planted this out um, a few months ago with the basil, mint, thyme. This is creeping um, lavender, which always smells rosemary. That always smells so good. Um, but we love having these big kind of like herbs available for us. And the more you cut, the more it grows. You know, for a garden this size, you know, this we, we had the space available to us. Um, so we wanted to build something, you know, of this magnitude. However, you don't need this much space to do vegetables. I mean, a, a simple raised bed, two simple raised beds, even, you know, a lot of vegetables do really well in pots. Um, as long as you have, you know, the right amount of sun, right amount of water and good drainage. I mean, I think you can really, you can do vegetables really anywhere. So um, let's go over here. There's some eggplants that are growing over here that are looking really good. Um, I love these, these little eggplants. Look at all the flowers on this. These are, these are the little fairy tale eggplant that are just so delicious and so good. I love growing fairy tale eggplant. Um, and then these kind of bigger Italian eggplants um, start coming later in the season which is always great. Over here we have a lot of acorn squash. This is all acorn squash and pumpkins that we've started growing over here. Um, something my husband and I, we've been doing now for about, I want to say three years, um, we've been growing all of our own garlic. So every year um, after the first year's batch, we always save um, you know, a few heads of garlic because one clove will turn into a head of garlic, which is amazing. So this is our little garlic patch. And um, you see the leaves are kind of, the scapes have already grown. We made scape pesto. We made um, eggs with scapes. We love all the garlic scapes. They're delicious. Um, and once these kind of lower leaves start to brown um, and kind of shrivel up, you know that it's ready. So these are almost ready is really exciting and we grow different varieties of garlic um, which we love and we have garlic all year you never have to buy it um, these aren't ripe yet but there's some amazing big acorn squashes starting to grow in there which is amazing 
Over here, um, we planted these blackberries, um, I'd say about two years ago, and they've just exploded in the past two years. We've got next year's canes already shooting up higher than the fence over there, which is so exciting. And if you really get in here and look, you can see how much fruit is really on um, all of these uh, stalks, which is really amazing. I mean, it's, we were, when this was in flower about a month ago, this was spectacular. These were all gorgeous, big white flowers. Um, and if you come kind of in here, which is beautiful, there are some that are really already ripening, all, a lot of different stages of ripeness. Um, but as you know, kind of the weeks roll along, these will all start to ripen. But what's so fun is that we come out here kind of every morning and we get to pick blackberries right off the vine and eat them. And then over here we have the raspberries. Um, again, we planted these about two years ago and they just took off. Um, so these are all again in kind of different stage of ripeness, but some of these are ready to go, some aren't. So maybe I'd say about another week we can come and really pick all these off. There are some back here that are really starting. These are actually also black raspberries, which are very interesting and they're very sweet, um, which is fantastic. Um, over here we've got some eggplant. I love eggplant. Eggplant in all ways. Eggplant roasted, fried, I mean, you name it. Eggplant pasta is one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. Pasta alla norma. Um, so we grow a lot of eggplant. So we love, we'll have these for dinner. Um, and then a good story about these kind of fantastic snowball alliums that are everywhere. Um, we had these in the ground, uh, these kind of just spring onions in the ground. Last year, we left them in the ground. They overwintered and um, around June, they started to put off flowers and they started to bloom. So sometimes in the garden too, we'll, we'll just leave things, we'll see what they do, we'll see if they come back the next year and it's always a surprise. Um, so there's a lot of spontaneity in the garden too, which always really excites us because um, we get something new every year and it's not, it's alive. It's not always the same. Um, and the bees and they just love, they just love these allium flowers. Um, and then here, which is a real treat, these are out of bloom already, but these are pine berries. So classically, of course, there's the red strawberry, but we decided to plant pine berries. Um, they're a little bit pineapple strawberry flavored and they're white. Um, they're really beautiful and these flowered and grew tons and tons and tons of pine berries that we were eating for weeks and throwing into smoothies and we couldn't get enough of them. Um, and this is something really special that not everyone has in their garden. So I would highly suggest planting pine berries because they are delicious. If we go over here, you'll see we have some different varieties of blueberry bushes. Um, something happened with this guy. We're not really sure what. But we have kind of all these different gorgeous varieties of, of blueberries that we love. These aren't ripe just yet. One day these will be. The idea here with the blueberry bushes was to create kind of a hedge of, of blueberries. So one day we'll have a full blueberry hedge that we can pick from, which is very exciting. Um, I love all this flowering time. is so beautiful. And sometimes, you know, even if we don't um, eat it like the thyme you know we didn't pick it fast enough we weren't eating it so it went to flower that's okay because it's still part of the you know greater ecosystem of the garden and kind of seeing how things um, flower and bloom and grow and um, we just kind of love that experimentation of it as well let's go over to the greenhouse which I'm really excited to show you guys that's really where the magic of the garden begins is in the greenhouse because most of our plants we grow from seed. 
now we're under the shade of this tree. It is very hot today to be out in the garden, but this is a sugar maple and we, my husband and I have actually been able to successfully tap this tree and our other sugar maple on the other side of the property. And we have made gallons and gallons of incredible maple syrup. Um, it's a intense process that requires a lot of boiling um, but it has been such a fun project. That was like one of the first things we did the first winter is we discovered that this was a sugar maple. So of course my husband is like, okay, we need to make maple syrup. And we did, and it was delicious. So I'm gonna take you guys into the greenhouse, which is right here. When we first purchased the property um, and we moved in, this, none of this was here. The real vision for this entire space that I'll walk you through was to have access to the potting room so that we could do all of our seeds and you know plant up pots and kind of have access to all of our tools then to walk out here into the greenhouse to transfer plants and seedlings depending on what season it is and then take for example right in the spring seedlings out into the garden so when we transformed this was originally just the back of the garage um, that was a little scary when we first moved in is now our beautiful potting room um, that we love working in um, almost every day we're out here. So we really wanted this to be a space where we could kind of do it all all at once, which was great, and have it all at our fingertips. Um, we'll go into the greenhouse first. It's very hot in here today. So we really wanted this space to feel, again, like another room. So it was an extension of the house um, and not just for utility. Obviously, we do a lot of um, utility work in here with our plants and, you know, obviously maintaining um, all of our different citrus. Usually all the citrus trees are in here over the winter. Um, but I still wanted it, I wanted it to be beautiful in addition to functional. And here we've got some, some of our amazing plants that are in here right now. In the summer, we usually pull everything out of the greenhouse just because it gets, they get plenty of sun and heat outside, which is great. And then you can have all of our beautiful plants kind of on display outside. But um, my favorite plant that has been growing tremendously is actually right here. Um, this bougainvillea. Uh, we bought this bougainvillea at a place called Logies, which is a spectacular, spectacular hundred year old greenhouse. It's about an hour from here, so it's a drive, but it's worth it. Every time we go, they specialize in incredible different varieties of plants from all over the world, things you've never seen before. Um, it's really spectacular. So this bougainvillea, we bought it, it was this big, it was a stick. Um, and it has just exploded over the past couple of years and is really putting on quite a show today, which is always amazing. So one day the goal is, is to just keep, you know, keep maintaining and taking care of it so it gets bigger and bigger and one day be able to train it kind of into the corner of the greenhouse like you kind of see in California where they're always cascading or in Italy or, um, so that's, that's the goal for this guy, but she's really a beauty. This plant that we love, again, also came from Logies. This is a kefir lime um, and the leaves are so beautiful and glossy and they smell amazing and it was in flower and it's actually starting to produce little bitty baby kefir limes. Um, they're great, you know, to zest. Um, they're kind of a different lime flavor. It's kind of hard to explain, but this, um, this tree has struggled a little bit and finally it looks amazing um, so we're really happy that we were we were able to continually bring it back to life it had some nasty bugs and scale and things that you don't want but things that happen in greenhouses especially with citrus fruit but right now it's starting to really put on kefir limes so if you come back in a few months we'll have limes for you so over here again we kind of transformed 
this whole side of the garage um, to really be a true working space for us, um, you know, for tools and to really come out here and work at the table and pop things on. We love all these kind of just old work tables um, that have such a cool personality to them. Um, but what I, why I really brought you over here was our, our figs are really starting to bear fruit right now, which is fantastic. Um, my husband has been obsessed with growing figs over the past four years, and we have literally taken, again, twigs. People have shipped him twigs from all over the world of, of fig cuttings, and he has been able to, you know, propagate them into incredible fruit-bearing um, fig tree specimens. And every year, these guys just get bigger and bigger and bigger. You can see just the growth that these are putting on um, already, and they just love sitting under the shade of this big sugar maple. Um, and every year the figs get better and sweeter and bigger. And it's just so much fun to come out here in about, I'd say, September, September, late October, when they're, they're really at their best. So we love watching the figs grow. And then we have different, again, different variety of citruses. Um, we have two different kumquat trees. These fruit will turn bright orange. We love doing like kumquat jam with a cheese board um, or just eating them um, plain is delicious too. Sometimes the skin is a little tough, so you do have to like work through it a little bit, but they are absolutely delicious. So all of these kind of green, beautiful fruit will turn orange when they're ready. Um, which is quite beautiful. This plant right here that looks a little fabulously out of control is a kiwi plant. Um, and we call it, um, again, this is from Logies and it was named the Jenny, which is my nickname. So we call it Fuzzy Jenny. Um, and this thing has died and come back to life and died and come back to life and is now thriving. We had some issues with the heat in our greenhouse and the over the winter a couple winters ago. So we lost, unfortunately, a lot of plants, but this one just continues to live on. So we're really excited to kind of see, again, we want to train it to go up and kind of crawl and it will probably bear fruit in the next three-ish years. Um, it hasn't put on any fruit yet. So come back in a few years and we'll check the kiwi. Um, so again, you know, kind of moving through these spaces, we really wanted this to be, you know, room to room to room, potting room to greenhouse to garden to kitchen. So into the potting room. So this is our potting room, which originally was a big, empty, kind of very scary, I just called it the back of the garage room. Um, that really was just animal overrun when we moved in, gross, storage, etc. And my husband and I, when we started envisioning, you know, kind of the greenhouse and the garden and what this space would be, we knew we also wanted to build a potting room where we could really, you know, obviously in the winter work, so we weren't outside, to work inside um, to really make sure that we could you know, do seedlings and, you know, get the garden going in January, February, um, which we were really excited to have a space that allowed us to continue gardening, even if it was cold outside. Um, so we put the plans together for this room and it came together really fast. Again, um, the contractor that we work with on all of our projects. He is amazing. And I'll walk you through. Um, he made all of these workbenches. Um, these were all custom made. He made them. He's an incredible mill worker. Um, and he also did the concrete countertops. Again, we wanted something that was really beautiful looking, but you know, also super durable. Um, and it was, it was a really fun day with three guys doing concrete countertops. Um, and I have it on video. It was wild watching all the guys try and flip the concrete out of the mold was, was a little wild, but 
it all came together and we really loved it with the wood and the stain um, and the countertops. And then my favorite piece that I found for the potting room is the big giant concrete trough sink, the double trough sink. Um, I found this on Facebook Marketplace. It was free if I got it out of someone's basement. So of course, I was on a mission to have a sink like this in the potting room, not only because visually it's just so cool, it's a piece of history. Um, this one specifically, the owner of the house said the house was from the 1930s. Again, this was in the basement, nobody wanted it. He was gonna break it into pieces to try and get it out of his basement. So I sent my guys to Rhode Island to go and pick it up at this person's house. And now it's here in our garage, which I love. And it's painted and dirty and it has a history and I just love it. And it comes in handy when we've got, you know, big pots and things that we need to put in here to wash. Um, and I just love it. It was such a good find. And we plumbed it in and that was that. <laughs> um, and then the other piece that I loved um, about this room too is you know the floors are original to the garage there's actually there's a date on the floor somewhere so someone carved that in which is very cool so I just love finding things like that I mean again we didn't do anything to the floors in here this was the original floor to the back of the garage um, it has this it must have been painted at one point because it's got this really cool blue kind of you know, deteriorated um, paint look, which is very, which is very cool that we love. And then to kind of go with that blue look, we found this again, kind of deteriorated, peeling blue paint um, workbench table, which we love working off of this table. And I'll show you guys. We've got some amazing um, alliums and different types of white flowers that I'm going to show you and we're going to do a little arrangement and I'll show you how I like to pop these up and put them on our table outside. So I'm really happy to have you guys here today in the potting room because what we're going to put together are some really fun um, summer arrangements with some florals, some flowers and some alliums that I really love that are very expressive and whimsical and these pots that we're going to pot up are going to go out on our table um, for tonight's dinner by the pizza oven um, and we love using potted flowers because we we like to reuse these in the garden anything that's a perennial once it's out of a pot and we've used it either for a dinner party or whether it's you know on the table or, or decorative or what have you we'll pop it in the ground so nothing goes to waste um, obviously unfortunately the annuals don't make it through the winter but something like this um, really beautiful summer beauty allium this is so whimsical with all of these kind of curly q little buds that are coming um, and it's going to be really magnificent purple it's really beautiful um, kind of like these that are these that are also really purple these are really beautiful um, alliums and whenever you take these out of a pot it just smells like beautiful fresh onion it's really fantastic um, so we reuse these all over you know all over the gardens whether we put this back around the magnolia tree where all the other kind of purple alliums are, or we'll pop this into um, the patio garden kind of and interplant them. Um, so we love to reuse things, which is very important to us. So all these plants don't go to waste. So we're gonna take these summer beauty alliums and I kind of love this uh, pot in front that I've already created with the alliums and then also kind of this cascading under planting of um i love this flower it's called diamond frost it couldn't be any better for me i love and it just keeps blooming and blooming and blooming and i love how wispy and uh kind of uh lacy this flower is and i love it mixed with how structured this allium is with all its leaves kind of shooting out from from it which is really beautiful so like i said these are going to go out on the table for dinner um so i always love to start with you know when you're working on a pot like this kind of what's 
in the center first um, and then kind of what's trailing or cascading or kind of billowing out from um, from there so I'm gonna take this out of my pot and I noticed the um, the roots even smell like onions, which are just amazing when, if you had smell-o-vision, um, this really has the most beautiful fragrance to it. This is really, really pot-bound, as you can tell. When, once the roots really start doing this, you gotta get it out of its pot. It needs to go into a bigger pot, so we're lucky today. Um, usually I'm a little bit more aggressive, depending on how root-bound this is, but I go in and, and I really break all this up. This will help it just take root into this new pot better and get water and nutrients. So all this is not all wrapped up. Sometimes we bring home things from like the nursery and I mean, you could just like, you know, chop this even in half and it'll be fine. Just really loosen those up. So that's good. And then obviously the way, you know, potting should look good all the way around you know pots are 360 degrees so whenever you're doing a tablescape you should really be able to see you know all the way around the pot so you want something that goes all the way around but you know there is a direction on the table so I do kind of like to check out you know what the best side of this plant might be maybe not that side maybe it's this side and then you know you position that to kind of directionally where you're looking um, I'm actually going to set this kind of towards the back um, of the pot because I want, I'm trying to achieve all of this kind of cascading forward, which is great. White shirt, potting room, mm, not the best choice, but here we are. It's okay. So we have a few more of these diamond frost plants, which we love. And we, we go to all different nurseries around here. That's the one thing that's really phenomenal about this area. And also, you know, whether it's 20 minutes this way or that way, there are some phenomenal landscape uh, stores and nurseries in this area. We go to Old Line Landscaping. We love them. Um, they're just right up the road. We go to Ballack's Garden Center. I probably mentioned before we go to Logies. Um, these are just a few of the places that we, we frequent quite often. Um, and they're just wonderful people and they have the most amazing uh, plants that we love to get and bring home. So this I'm just breaking up because I'm trying to fit it into this pot. I probably should use a bigger pot, but we're doing, putting this on the table so I didn't want it to be too big. So I'm just taking this root ball here so I don't make a giant mess. I'm just taking this root ball here and just kind of breaking, breaking this up. Plant will be fine. <laughs> We're just taking some of this excess dirt off of this. And then again, I just kind of always look to see which direction I want something to go in. And then I just start to kind of pop all of these into place here. And we'll do it again with another one. I fit three into my last pot. I always squeeze when they come out. There's dirt all over me, but that's okay. Gardening in our finery. So again, just like loosening this up, I wanna make it a little smaller, but still keep those roots. And then I'm going to go in here and again, check which direction I want this going in. I think it's okay. And then I just pop this in here. Once you have this kind of spread that you're looking for, I then go in with some more fresh uh, potting mix. Break up this big clump that's in here. And I just go in and I fill in all these gaps to really make sure that this is potted properly. And then of course, once you're done, I'm not gonna fill this whole pot in right now, I will in a little. Once you're done, of course, we water. I love these canisters, aren't these darling? This is the company um, Hawes out of England. 
and they come in all shapes and sizes and colors and they're just the most beautiful. So we just go in and water. Try not to water the flowers themselves. They don't love that. So I just try to water really low down below and that's it. So now we're gonna bring these gorgeous pots out to our dining table out by the pizza oven and we're gonna make some dinner and light the pizza oven. So now we're gonna walk over to the other side of the property um, where kind of our patios are, where we love to entertain. Um, we have additional garden spaces over there as well. And one of our newest garden space, it's a new old garden space. It was originally when we moved in a garden of weeds, which we then turned into the original vegetable garden uh, for the house. And then once we built the big vegetable garden, we were kind of left with, well, what do we do with that now? So I'll show you what we did with it. Hey, bud. This is Apollo. <laughs> hey, buddy. Apollo grew up here. When we first got him, it was COVID and we moved into the house and we got Apollo and this is, this is his home. We spend time, spend a lot of time here and we also live in Manhattan. And whenever we go to Manhattan, I know he gets really sad because this is really his, this is his domain. He's so happy here. Um, but we just walked around from the potting room and the greenhouse and the garden. Right now we're on the side of the patio garden, which I'll show you guys in a little bit but we're actually gonna walk around to the new, brand new rose garden that we just planted. Um, and that's the space where we transitioned the vegetable garden into the rose garden. So let's go that way. Come on, bud. Come on. Apollo, let's go. Come on. Let's go to the garden. So in here, um, I really love formal gardening. Um, my husband likes a bit more organic kind of native style plantings where it's kind of, and you'll see that in the patio garden, which is right next to the rose garden, where, you know, one space is very planted and organic and has a lot of different varieties, like a true kind of border going on. Whereas in here, I really love the formality. So that kind of juxtaposition we think works very well because we both kind of get what we love in a way. We drew out kind of the, the spaces and the different kind of areas and planting areas that we wanted to create in the garden. Um, and really, you know, taking in mind, you know, that kind of really formal symmetry style that I love that you really see in kind of classical French and English gardens. Um, and we decided to completely rip out everything that was here and we put in all of these box. Um, actually, Martha Stewart has an amazing um, boxwood uh, resource where we sourced all of these little baby boxwoods, um, which one day will grow into a beautiful hedge. Um, she is the boxwood queen, so anything she says about box goes. Um, and this resource was phenomenal. So we were able to space out and plant all of these little baby boxes um, to really start to create that architecture in the garden. And this will take time to grow, but it is kind of fabulous to watch it as it gets bigger and bigger. Um, and we'll be able to hedge that once it's a true hedge. And we decided to, um, in each of the space, have one variety of rose. So all the roses in the garden are David Austin. They're all um, from England. We are setting timers and are first in line when their sale goes up online um, every season. And we had all of these shipped in bare root. So this is really their very, very first moment that they're growing. Uh, we planted these, I wanna say probably in late April, early May, which was very exciting. So each bed is its own color story. So here we have some beautiful kind of sherberty, orange, pink. Um, and we, I also played with the color in here too. So once the roses really start blooming, when you come in, we have the very fragrant, fragrant white roses in the front. Um, so everything here is, is white and then it transitions into gorgeous peachy, 
um, yellows and oranges and then goes around into pinks and gets really dramatic in the back um, in reds, beautiful, beautiful red roses. Um, I love the big double flowering roses. So when you come back and everything's in bloom, all the big roses that are double flowering, it'll be really romantic and very dramatic. So if you come with me this way, so we wanted some other different types of plants and things is here in here as well. Um, so in the inner kind of circle, um, we put this big giant wood obelisk that we love. We have two climbing roses on opposite sides of this obelisk. So as the roses gets bigger, we'll train them to kind of twist and go up the obelisk um, as they grow. And then we underplanted it with this spectacular lavender that as you can see just draws in all the bees and all the butterflies and it's very active with <laughs> with the bees and the butterflies they're happy today because it's sunny um, and again with the hedging so once this grows in this will look really magnificent once it, once it's encased in that boxwood hedge with the roses that are really twisting up that center a local um, someone who lives locally about 20 minutes away made this for us um, he's an amazing woodworker. So we also have some seating that we wanted in the garden. So again, antique, little antique chairs and benches that we have in the garden. Over here again, we have um, not in bloom yet, but in the back here, the vision was this is a white clematis that has been here since we moved in and it's not in bloom right now this blooms very early in the spring but this gorgeous kind of wall of white that it creates we wanted to also bring in um, with the James Galloway it's a climbing rose again from David Austin that's this gorgeous yellow um, so to contrast that with the white and the yellow and then the deep pinks and reds that we have over here will be really beautiful this is a funny story. You're probably wondering what all this is. We, because this was a vegetable garden, um, we sometimes get rogue vegetables that are still growing. Um, we had some radicchio growing over here earlier in the season. Um, and we have a ton of green and purple asparagus that we planted back here about three years ago. They take really three years to get going before you can start eating them. Um, so this is all asparagus and this too, that we will one day, you know, kind of uproot all of this if we can, not sure if we can, but we're gonna move the asparagus to the new garden. But it's kind of funny how it, no one ever really sees asparagus grows, grow into a tree. Um, so it's quite spectacular to watch that just kind of get unruly in this very um, controlled garden area. On a recent trip to Coronado, California, I was on a walk in a quiet neighborhood when I abruptly stopped after spotting a gorgeous garden. I couldn't help but knock on the front door. Marilee Benzian warmly greeted me and invited me inside. She told me she had just lost her beloved husband Peter of 50 years to pancreatic cancer. She told me how they met in 1972 and went on to marry and have four children together. I learned that Peter was a man of many talents, an army veteran, a distinguished lawyer, always fighting for the underdog, a loving husband, father, and grandfather. So a big thank you to Mary Lee for graciously inviting me and Homeworthy for a tour of her gardens and home, which you would never believe was in foreclosure when they purchased it. Enjoy this special episode. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Hi, Homeworthy. Welcome to my home in Coronado. Come on in. Hi, I'm Marilee Benzian, and we're here at my house in Coronado, California. And it's a little cottage that grew and grew, so we had more children, and we've been so happy here. And it's 
just a great place to live. I love my house. It was built in 1898, and the architect was Irving Gill, who's quite famous. He it was worked with Requa, and it was kind of the age of Frank Lloyd Wright, but before that. And it, uh, we've kept all his design, these doors and the hardware and the siding of the house is exactly the same and the mantle and the, it has the harp stairway which is one of the, his things that he has in a lot of houses and uh, it's so old but we pushed out the kitchen and we added uh, the granny flat and bathroom as our family was growing from two children to four. And it's just the most wonderful town. It's uh, an island and people are just very friendly. There's no crime. We have the beach, which is great. And my husband could just drive over the bridge five minutes to downtown to work. We have great public schools. My kids all went to public school, one to boarding school. and. Uh, it's just wonderful. This is a great geranium. I give everyone a piece because you don't even have to root it. It just grows. It's amazing. Even my niece in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where it's just freezing and ice, I give her a couple pieces and it's just now climbing all over her front of her house. These are um, freesia and they're native to the native to Coronado. So those also a really great thing to grow here. This vine is um, called uh, Blue Thernbergia. And it is really a great plant and it's climbed all the way up over the arbor, the top and it blooms like crazy. You might be hearing a few planes and helicopters and that is the sound of freedom. So we have North Island Naval Base just down the, the way here and when those sounds are on that means the ship is coming in. When we moved here it was all dirt. They were in the middle of remodel and I had to cry about it. <laughs> but then I started designing my garden and I have pictures old ones when things were little and kind of changed. And uh, now it, it just takes care of itself. It's great because the plants are all mature. Years ago, I had a nursery here in Coronado and that's where I really started designing my English garden and collecting all my different species of roses. And I always put in some vegetables and fruits too with it. My parents always had a big veggie garden and fruit trees and, and flowers. They were gardeners and as a hobby. And so I think that, but just by studying with my partner and then we used our houses and we got a job across the street. And those were a laboratory. These are Color Magic. These are, and this is Apricot Dream. And they're just great bloomers. They'll be blooming now until we cut them in December. So it's great rows to have. Here's a little volunteer, nasturtium. And those are edibles. You can put them on your salad. The white are iceberg. It's another great rose. It just blooms and blooms and makes a great hedge because it's blooming all the time doesn't get diseased. Really great rows. This is my apple tree. There's some baby apples on there. They were not good for years. They were just terrible. And then uh, the car wash guy gave me a one gallon sunflower tree, which is just not out yet. But it came from a little one gallon and it grew as big as this. So the two of them must have cross-pollinated because now the apples are great. This is Meyer lemon and they're just delicious. The first year it had three lemons. I was so happy after this baby. So I came out to get one and there were two. 
and I asked my husband, did you, did you pick one of those lemons? He said, no, some guy came by and said, is it okay if I have one of your lemons? And I said, sure. I said, no, I waited for years for this. You cook with them and have them in your cocktail and make lemonade. This rose is Eden and it's a climber and it's my favorite rose. It reminds me of the David Austin English roses and I have it all over my whole garden. People also cut them. Somebody brought me a photograph, rang the doorbell and brought me a photograph from the front. They did a really nice photograph and there was a lady right over by the gate and my daughter answered the door and they said, so is the lady who built this garden, is she alive? And my daughter said, yeah, that's my mom, she is. And she said, and is that her right over there? And she said, actually, no, that would be someone who came with their clippers to steal our roses and stole every one of them, the candy canes. <laughs> People do often. And the thing is, if they would only ask me, I, of course, would give them. These are the candy cane. And it's a climber also. This is a Tiaha poppy. And the English just would love to have this plant, but it's too cold there. They're always trying, but it's great here. And it has these, its common name is fried egg. And it gets this big white poppy with a big yellow center. These are my favorite rows, the Eden climbing rows. They're Chinese rows and they remind me of the David Austin. And these will climb up over the top there. This is uh, Fame, is the name of this rose. And it's just a really good rose, really doesn't get diseased and gives a nice color. And then this is Digitalis or Foxglove. And then this is a volunteer, which means it just must be a native, but it just turns up in the garden. I just, every day I'm out here and I also have the rose doctor who comes and feeds them and sprays if, if necessary and he'll cut them back too. Just every day it's different. It's, it's, in Japan, it, gardening is one of the arts. And for me, it's like a palette and I look at it and I can see, oh, maybe I need to move this foxglove over here there's kind of a hole or I just I just love to do it the painting this is a dahlia and they're big they're tubers this has been blooming for months and it probably go right through the summer just love that plant and here these are delphinium people come to have their photos and so cute they'll come with uh you know, their child's communion or something and the whole family or they all get, they say, is it okay? Say, yes, come on. And I always tell people the garden's for everyone and I do give people a rose if they want one. But the way I find out that th somebody's getting them, I'll go over to the uh, convenience store down on the corner. They, every day they were having this huge bouquet of roses and I knew those were my roses. So I asked him, uh, so where did you get those roses? And he said, well, there's a really nice lady who just comes and she has a big basket full and just brings them to us every few days. <laughs> and this is a freeway plant, but I love it. If you want to start a garden or an English garden, but any garden, you want to put the lower plants and get some height because it's just a little boring when they're all the same, same height. And they're always volunteers, which is so fun because things seed in and especially this year, we had a lot of rain. So these nasturtiums came and the delphiniums, I hadn't seen those in years. This is lobelia, which is fantastic little edge, edging plant or in a, a basket to hang over the sides. These are freesia and they're bulbs and they're just finishing. They smell really good and they were beautiful, but they have to be cut back soon. It's really a good plant because it so will always come back and grow and multiply. And um, this 
It's Mexican Evening Primrose. And it just is like a weed. It just, I take it all out in the winter, cut it out, and then it just comes back, it seeds itself. The calla lilies um, are great. They're so easy. They grow in the sun and the shade here because of our climate. And they multiply also. I mean, there was just one and it's multiplied over the years. And here's my favorite rose, Eden, up there that's just starting to come. And it's up on top here, too. Here's a calla that jumped over. These are daylilies, and they're really easy to grow, and they just don't get sick, and they're very reliable. This is a really unusual one because it has that colored eye that I got from a guy out in El Cajon who has them in his backyard, hundreds of them. Here are the artichokes over here. Here's one, a couple coming. These are clivia, and they were full on both sides, and a friend moved in down the street, and they were there. She didn't like them, so I went over and dug them up and put them in. I love my calla lilies, and I think that it's because I loved Betty Davis, and she, there's a famous line, she said, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeVille. So this is actually a garden path that is hiding your, um, a French drain. This was a muddy mess because this giant hill. So we made the building path here and tons of water just comes down this hill here. And uh, we just added this, there's like drainage under here, but it's actually a great path as well. And then we figured out the right trees for here. So like weeping willows like water and they drink all the water. This was a crab apple tree that we were like, we want a crab apple tree, city it move. And we had three crab apples, two of them died because they were drowning. But amazing when we added the weeping willows and this maple that likes to drink water, the crab apple started to thrive. So thinking about just the, the ecosystem uh, was really helpful. And now the trees are actually doing quite well. And they got that amazing um, urn over there. That's a 19th century French urn. So the house being very mid-century modern, and as I've grown in my um, career as an interior designer and learning about different periods, uh, really the garden is where I've incorporated a lot of much older items so that are much older than mid-century and you know more international less american and we'll, we'll see that as we walk through um so here like these columns are british from the i think 1820s i think they're they're so beautiful and um i have to say in the garden uh this garden started as a powerpoint i i, I started to love arranging flowers and um i will see later there's vegetable beds and i used to raise vegetables and this when we first built this house we went with a really simple grass like mid-century garden we didn't have a lot of trees we didn't have budget for trees we didn't have budget for much gardening and this garden started much smaller and i and i read martha stewart and kevin sharkey's book and was like okay, if you want a cutting garden, these are the perennials you want to start with. And so I had my PowerPoint of perennials. Um, I met uh, my neighbor had a gardener, Linda Gibson of Gibson. Uh, so she's a local gardener who I love. We now like text all the time and this garden would not happen without her. And we have such an amazing partnership. Um, and working together, but a lot of the um, the structure and the the beauty and uh, this garden is is definitely a team effort and a ton of credit to Linda and and her team of people. Um, so this side is really you know we've learned what works here and what doesn't. Like I was saying about the willows. Also, these are all willows that. Um, are hiding the deer fence so you can't have a garden in the hudson valley because of deer so these you know the and it takes years for these willows to grow but they're nijiki willows they're japanese willows um, i think they're really beautiful they change colors in the um, seasons and so this is uh, on this side is plants that like water hydrangea the key word hydro um, they love water. So these are new, but they'll, they'll, they'll really grow. And this garden, what's amazing about it is 
all year, like from the time the crocuses come up till the final frost, different things are coming in and out. So there's always something to cut and it looks beautiful as it is, but there's really like, I'm constantly cutting from it. I have my snippers here um, and just thinking about how to uh, plant things that are really good for cutting and look really good as a garden. So as we go through, you know, you see the, um, the tulips and daffodils. We had, Linda and I made a mistake this year where I thought I was buying the tulips and daffodils and she thought she was. And we each bought like a thousand. And so there were like an outrageous amount of tulips and daffodils. The daffodils come back every year. The tulips don't always come back. I mean, I kind of like Martha Stewart. I think you see this picture in her book of, she has like 10,000 daffodils. So um, I'm far away from that. So this, the mirroring the columns here are these uh, juniper. So you have the, the structure of the garden. Linda talks about that a lot. And you think, look at like the flow and you know, the low juniper here, these lilies, look at this gorgeous, this just came up, um, these yellow lilies. And um, the rabbits have been reproducing like bunny rabbits this year. I'm keeping it G rated for Homeworthy but uh, the rabbits have been out of control. So we usually have these gorgeous hollyhocks everywhere, but they've been rabbit food. And uh, let's see, these, these irises are so pretty. These hydrangeas are starting. This pink is the, called bee bomb. You see it attracts, the poll attracts bees. Um, I love having pollinators here because they pollinate everything. They bring the bees to the yard. So it just like spreads and really it's something that does quite well here. This cat mint does really well um, and it's really great for cutting. The lilies today are just out. Every day there's something, something different. Um, butterflies are here. This is my one Japanese maple that this is its first year doing quite well. It often gets frost damage, but it's thriving this year. In fact, it's getting almost too big. And these are climbing geranium, which I just love because they're really low and they spread to the ground and they're sort of wild. They're wild looking, quite beautiful. And so the path continues. Over here, um, these are all lilacs. And so there's this um, picture that Kevin Sharkey, who uh, worked for Martha, has in this, this Martha Stewart book of this arrangement where he has like five different shades of lilac from white to dark purple. And um, a couple of years ago, my, my mom tragically passed away and her favorite plant was lilac. And so I remember when I was a kid, I would go home and cut her lilacs, which was stealing from neighbors lilac trees. But I don't, didn't, I don't know. Did I think that was a problem? Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, I brought her lilacs. I was rewarded, so it was good. Um, so when she passed away, uh, we planted this lilac grove here that just looks like normal bushes all year, but for like two or three weeks, it's absolutely beautiful colors of, of lilacs. And then you can begin to see the terrible view of the Catskill Mountains. And you can see a lot of the landscaping effort has been to hide the deer fence. So we can also wrap around the garden um, a lot of ornamental trees, more bee balm, the roses, the roses come and go. This, they, this is sort of the end of their first show for the summer. And so the garden really does have phases. And this is, I would say this is like peak early summer. Um, there's a book I love, a cookbook I love called Six Seasons. And you know, there's typically where we taught there's four seasons, but in his book, which, and I also think in the garden, there's six seasons because there's um, early summer, midsummer, and late summer. And I think this is early summer here. So we're seeing the alley, these allium are starting. Um, we're seeing like the bee bomb are at peak and they'll, they'll keep flowering all summer. The hydrangea will flower all summer. <laughs> these irises are so spectacular. Irises and lilies are in the same family. It's confusing. These are, these are lilies. These are allium as well. Uh, I think they're so fun. They just have a sense of humor. These are Globemaster Allium. Uh, they're, they look very Dr. Seussian. They're early in. The peonies are done. Sedum do really well, which is sort of the, the succulent here. These are, um, just came up today. Like every time you come up here, there's things coming, coming and going. Um, these are balloon flowers, which are so cool. You can see they like are shaped like balloons. You can see all the bees coming to the, the bee bomb yard. 
these roses will come back, but they're rose bugs be loving those roses. And I just added these pots this year for some structure. Then coming over here, um, I just got this bench and it still has the tag on it. I mean, not the real tag. It was from this auction, um, this place in Connecticut, uh, these, this husband and wife spent half of their year in France and half in Connecticut. And they have just amazing old garden items. And then they closed their shop and had an auction and I had it on my calendar and I got, this is a 19th century, um, Scottish bench. And I just think it's, it's so beautiful, um, in the auction. And then this is I guess my, my friend Ben calls it my wagon wheel. And I always joke with my husband, we're going to renew our vows under here. And he's like, absolutely not. But um, it allows you to have climbing. And climbing things take a really long time. This is uh, clematis, or as the British say, clematis. I love Monty Don. There's this show in the UK that's been on BBC for forever called Gardener's World. And it's very, very calming. And Monty Don just talks about his garden. And then they interview gardeners all over the UK. My husband calls it Xanax for, for bedtime. You watch them and they're like, today we're gonna tour a clematis garden. And so this is clematis as the British say. And um, we have six different kinds of clematis climbing and they're doing quite well. They're just so beautiful. There's, you can see this variety is here, this variety, they, they come and go all summer. Um, this one sort of looks like it looks like a 60s bob or a wig. Um, it, it's, it's going, but more will come back. And, you know, when you think of flower arrangements, I like to think of fillers, thrillers, and spillers. And so this is a really good filler. And then over here, you can see, well, you can see the wig coming out of the lion. So I've just been adding as I find antiques, uh, how the, when that, was blooming it looked like it was coming out of his head which was cool and then we have our climbing hydrangea over here this will you have to keep them off the house because they will they're very aggressive but hopefully they bloom um, we're still still in June so and then this box is for herbs and now we're gonna come over here to the pool patio and I will show you that part of the outdoor space So a walk from the, so the crest, we call this the Crescent Garden, and to the pool area. So the year before the pandemic, actually for years coming up here, friends would be like, this house would be way better with a pool. And uh, we didn't have one. And a pool destroys everything. So this was a total mess, but we did the pool. And um, it has a waterfall edge. It, it's amazing to have a pool. And um, I really like the idea of the grass into the, the marble coping. So this is um, local marble as well. Into the same Najiki willows, um, into the terrible view. And then the patio, these pots are from a company called Bergs and B-E-R-G-S. They're designed in Denmark and made in Italy. And I just think they have the most beautiful pots and I love, um, choosing the structure and the construction of the flowers. And this year we did oranges and purples. And so um, Linda uh, really talks about each pot having a focal point. And I love the concept of fillers, spillers, and thrillers, and then color theory. And another thing I learned from Linda about making a pot like this is thinking about leaf structure. So if you have like a, it's the same with interiors. If you're gonna do pattern, if you're gonna mix patterns, do a large scale pattern and a small scale pattern. So like this is a small scale, um, this is small scale, like this is more large scale. And you see how the colors and textures or like the longer shape playing against the, um, the other shapes or how this fern sort of plays in here. So we do focal points, fillers, fillers, and spillers, thinking about color and thinking about uh, broad leaves and narrow leaves next to each other scale. And here's some more. I had a lot of fun at the, I knew I had a good 
like carts of flowers when people were trying to shop off my cart at the nursery. I was like, mm -mm, those are mine, go find your own. Um, these are super fun and cool and beautiful and I'm so glad they flowered purple because I wasn't quite sure what the flower would look like when I got them in the spring. This is a magnolia, which is actually doing quite well. And then these are forget-me-nots when my husband's um, cousin Priscilla, who was a total character from Southie Boston, passed away. She had uh, organized her entire funeral and part of it was everyone got a packet of forget-me-nots. And we actually originally planted them in there, but they've made their way here. So every year, somehow Priscilla's forget-me-nots find their way into the, the garden somewhere. I just finished this. Um, like I said, I love upholstery and I think it can make such a difference. These are just RH chairs we've had forever. Um, but I just finished this, uh, making these, I love a contrast piping and I think they look so chic. This is, um, a pillow with, uh, um, really old fabric that I found at, um, the shop in the Lower East Side, a woman named Paula Rubenstein. She has a great shop of vintage fabrics and, um, this is a Schumacher stripe that is beautiful. These are not, I mean, it is sort of tricky here to have, um, cause you have the fire and then having drinks here. It's not, it's not the most conducive for food and having a fire, but it looks pretty. And then we have the outdoor speakers here for our party house. And then I just did these as well, which is sort of the inspo. Well, the inspo for this was Yves Saint Laurent's uh, Rue Babylon in Paris. He has these gorgeous outdoor green, um, upholstered chairs. And then there's also some Slim Aaron's photos from uh, Italy in the 60s and 70s. It has this gorgeous like white and green cabana stripes. And then here, this fabric is so pretty. It has the navy blue and green. And then, and we have, um, having light and music here is really nice in the outside. And then made these as well, which are, have the, the blue with the same white stripe uh, for the, and sort of here you see like, these are like, you know, this is uh, mixing cedar and these really utilitarian chairs that are from DWR and, um, made them, made them my own with, uh, upholstery and, uh, accessories, I guess. But then you see these fun, like old French urns on, on the pool and more pot, more Berg's pots. Like they're just so, so beautiful. So um, now we're gonna go from this pool deck to the cutting garden. Join me. All right, so now we're gonna tour the cutting garden which is uh, six raised beds that originally it was all vegetables and um, I would miss a week here and it would go absolutely crazy. And I can actually buy really great vegetables, but it's um, harder and more expensive to buy really great flowers. So this has become a mostly flower uh, with some vegetables. You can see the lettuces here. These tomatoes, actually, this is the first year I've grown tomatoes from seed because uh, I have a greenhouse. So started them as little seeds, started the um, basil as seed as well. And I like putting basil by the tomato because um, the flowering of the basil brings the pollinators to the tomatoes. That's all different kinds of basil. This is mint, which is a weed. It's also really great for uh, arrangements because it lasts a long time. And these are just cosmos that I think are really great summer flowers. This is going to be a ton of zinnia of all different colors. Um, one trick when you first plant the zinnia right before, you know, right when they start the same with zinnia and cosmos and dahlias even, you snip the middle from the, the top plant and they spread out. So, you know, they were, they're flowering a little late because I snipped them all, but they're going to be really wide and they'll produce twice as many flowers that way. These are just wild poppies that, um, you know, just have grown quite well here. So we kept them. We have some other stuff coming in behind them. And then this was another poppy that made its way here, which is so beautiful. And these are all dahlias from tubers that each stake is, is a dahlia. So they're, they don't, you don't water the dahlias until they come through the ground. But, um, these are like weird 
uh, rare dahlias that I can't wait to see what they look like because this is my first year growing them. So let's go from the uh, raised bed cutting garden up to the greenhouse. So this is the greenhouse, which is something I just put in last year. Um, so it started as, I want, you know, let's have a greenhouse. And so I found this beautiful greenhouse that was mid-century. It was the style of the house. And I thought, oh, we'll just lay a cement floor and we'll build a greenhouse. But nothing's ever that easy because the land was really slanted. So we needed to have a retaining wall. And so I decided to use local bluestone for the retaining wall. And I was really into French uh, decor, especially French garden decor. So it is a mid-century structure with a lot of French uh, decorative items and this path. So it's like a, a small walled garden here and it gets really, really hot. That's why they call it a greenhouse. Um, and so this is our Lavender, which is the first year of the lavender, and it is thriving here. And then nasturtium, or the edible orange flower, again, purple and orange is such a nice combo. This was from that store that I mentioned. Uh, this is a faux bois, which means fake wood, like an old French bench, and it looks like fake wood. Um, and this fountain is uh, 19th century from Paris, and it just was like the right scale for this uh, wall. And um, it's actually run by a garden pump. So we built like a, like I said, this was supposed to be a really simple greenhouse, but it never is. And so this has a, just a pond pump. We built a uh, concrete uh, water storage beneath it and the water goes into it and recirculates through. But it, it looks like when you go to like Italy or France and you just have the, the running water, um, don't tell. And the thing about building walls like this is the snakes really love it and I know they're just garter snakes, but I like it when I don't see them, so I don't see them today. Maybe we can get some wildlife footage, but none here. And these are 1940s French Deco outdoor chairs. I love 1940s uh, decor. I love 1940s French decor, because it was like right before mass manufacturing, so you still have, like they, they look very modern, but they also still look very old fashioned. I love the patina of them. Um, I was so thrilled to find these. And then these are three ornamental apple trees and my solar lighting. So as we go into the greenhouse, you can't really have much in the greenhouse in the summer except succulents. And so I've been growing succulents. These are French cafe tables and lots of Berg's pots as well with a pencil cactus. I love this. Um, succulent tray it's really really warm in here look at this guy this is another bird's pot that i think is just so beautiful and these these cactus i think cactuses are camp these came um mail order and you just sort of they came chopped and you just put them in the dirt and they they thrive and i think this is really fun i love the feet of this column i would guess this is like 1940s if i had to guess i could totally be wrong this is a pickling jar that is great for, for here. I love the scale of it. Um, these are old, sort of more mid-century. I love how beat up and patina that is. These are old French, like I said, French cafe. Tables, um, more succulents. My dried hydrangeas from last year that were too pretty to throw away. And then lots of fans, because you can never have enough fans. Actually, something cool about this is these windows are tied to a thermostat. And when it gets past a certain temperature, which is always, they automatically open, which I thought was a, a really cool feature here. So let's uh, get out of the greenhouse and we'll go back to the garden to cut some flowers to make an arrangement and then we'll finish drawing the house. Hey, lady.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content, shopping guides, and so much more.